Welcome to the Needham School Spotlight. I'm Dan Goodykant, Superintendent of Needham Public Schools. Recently, the school committee adopted a budget for the 2008-2009 school year, representing a 4.5% increase over the current year's spending. Today's program will focus on the proposed budget, its development, and address what's in store as we move forward to provide quality services to the students of the Needham Public Schools. Joining me today for this discussion is the school department's Director of Financial Services, Ann Galati, and also School Committee Chair Don Gratz, Vice Chair Michael Grice, and liaison to the Finance Committee, Mary Ann Cooley. Welcome and thanks for joining me. Thank you. Good morning. I think, Don, actually, if we could uh, start out with uh, you and maybe perhaps you could provide some context and big picture on the budget. Uh, this, this past year, the uh, School Committee, again, uh, and school administration worked closely with town boards, the Finance Committee, Selectmen, Town Manager's Office to develop the FY09 budget. Ultimately, the school committee arrived at a 4.5 percent budget request. How did the process work out in your view and, and uh, are you satisfied with the results so far? Good question. Uh, I'm satisfied, but what I'd like to do is give a little perspective um, going back a few years and in fact um, I pulled out a few figures to give people a perspective on where we are in terms of the budget now I'm going back to 1990 for my first figure, and that is, in 1990, we spent $5,700 per child for education, on average. In 2005, 15 years later, adjusted for inflation, we spent 5842 That's a difference of $142 per child over a 15-year span. And I think that uh, figure alone indicates that there's not been a huge increase in spending. In 2002-2003, as many people remember, the state hit a, a <coughs> fiscal budget crunch. And at that point, they were putting in about $1,000 per student out of what we were spending. That reduced pretty substantially. And in last year, in fiscal 07, they were still only putting in 870 dollars per student. So our costs go up, the state uh, contribution to those costs went down in 2003. Now they started to bring that back up and, and it's partly through the good efforts of our legislators, uh, Lyda Harkins and Scott Brown, that communities like Needham are being brought up to a floor of 17 percent of our cost. It, it's, it's better than we have been, but it's still been an issue for us. So what we've got is um, we're paying pretty much the same per student. The state is contributing less than they used to to what we have to, to pay. And the third point is costs go up. Um, some of those costs are accounted for in what I said by inflation, but some of them are not. Um, we're not paying the same for gasoline for transportation, you know, to get kids around. We're, we've added a lot of technology and we've added, in fact, a number of new schools that increase costs. And we're not paying teachers the same salaries we were in 1990. And if we were, we wouldn't have any. So that brings us to this year. Um, the way the budget worked is the superintendent meets with the staff and, and presents an initial budget in December. Um, after cutting back what the staff was looking for, that was 7.3%. Um, town said we had uh, enough money for us to increase our budget by 3%. So there's a big gap there. And um, with a lot of discussion, we have agreed on a 4.5% increase. Now, I think given the town's revenues, that's a good place to be. Um, but it also represents um, a reduction, and it's on the screen, a reduction um, in revenue, and it includes cutting the equivalent of 5.4 teachers. So. I feel good about the budget given the revenue that the town has, the process we went through, it's been very amicable. We, we are part of a, a larger town and the town has other needs, not just the schools. I don't feel as good by the fact that we still have to cut because the revenue isn't available, available and the cuts have gone up. So that's my overview on where we are in the budget. You mentioned that the directors, when they sat down initially, and, and principals, they actually came up with requests over, I believe, 13 percent or so, and we had to scale those further back. Right. The good news is that principals and directors and teachers are thinking about a lot of good programs for Needham students. 
The reality is that has to be balanced with town and, and school needs, and so there has to be a happy medium, although we're even further off from that because I, I believe, um, and our initial request was a 7.3% request to the school committee, and that had to be scaled back. Uh, Don, Don's mentioned that there are some pressures on, on the budget. Maybe, Ian, you could share uh, with us what are some of those pressures, what are some of the, the, the key points that went into the, the budget and, and drive some of these costs? Sure. Um, some, the, there are some pressures that we feel every year. Some of them are becoming sort of increasing pressures as the years go on and more things um, seem to be reduced from the budget. But probably the biggest pressure on the budget is the cost of simply moving our people forward from year to year. Uh, we have 1.9 million in new revenue for this year. The cost of um, bringing our staff to the next year of their employment is about 1.3 million dollars of that total. Uh, that's not unexpected. We're 86 86 percent of our budget is salaries. We are a service organization. Uh, we're in the people business of educating people, so people are our biggest expense. Um, there are, of course, other expenses that um, put pressure on the new revenue as well, and that is the cost of special education meeting requirements that um, around uh, student services, uh, student transportation needs. Um, uh, there is a growing uh, English language learner population that um, is uh, requiring services that uh, haven't been provided in uh, the past. Um, we also have um, pressures that we place on ourselves to try to keep fees low to students, for instance, uh, in programs such as athletics or transportation. We try to uh, subsidize those programs to the extent that we can. Um, um, again, the pressure to restore things that may have been cut in previous years, supplies, other things, those sort of all factor into some of the, the budget and, of course, enrollment, uh, meeting the growth in um, st secondary student populations at the middle school, providing new teachers at that level. Um, those are all some of the drivers that affect our budget. Dan, I think, you know, you focus, we talk about the fact that we're a people business, and then people tend to focus on salaries as if salaries are the problem. But if you go back to look at Don's <laughs> numbers, you go back just 10 years ago, from 1996 or so, and you look at the budget the town meeting voted us, and you just take that budget forward and you adjust merely for CPI inflation and enrollment growth. We are about two or two and a half million dollars below where that would have been. So these factors are real and they are driving our costs. But what I think is important for people to realize is that if you just adjust it for those bare figures, we are still a couple million dollars below where we would be. So the, the pressure, you know, it isn't specifically saying, oh, we're paying too much or the special ed is costing us too much. Yes, those are increasing. But even just <coughs> looking at those basic inflation and enrollment numbers, we are behind where we should be. Well, and, and, and the result is that even though the budget is proposed to increase by 4.5 percent, the reality is, as Don pointed out, is that we have to cut back on some of our current levels of staffing to support some staffing and programs in other areas, particularly around the mandated programs, English language learners, special education, um, that, that we're obligated to provide. So it, it is a, it's a mixed bag uh, in there um, in, 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 just a, in just a bit. Um, Marianne, you've been looking at, uh, and touched on this, on, on enrollment. You've, been, you've spent some time um, looking at enrollment. You're the liaison to the Future School Needs Committee. Um, and I know that uh, uh, enrollment certainly is a factor in the development of any budget. Where, where, where are we at with enrollment, and how is that affecting what we're, what we're doing? Well, it's our anticipation that our enrollment will likely peak next year. We'll have to see, of course, what really happens. But what we have seen is sort of steady enrollment growth since 1990. Um, the rate has been about 2 percent, and it's over a 1,000 children. Um, so that next year we will be servicing um, over 5,000 children through Needham Public Schools for our K-12 to enrollment. So that represents a challenge because, you know, the budget, if you just take 2.5 percent over last year and sort of start with that, or even the town's budget number of about 4 percent doesn't account for just regular salaries of carrying the normal servicing ahead plus the, the number of classrooms. And what we're seeing next year, as Ann mentioned, is um, kind of the bubble of enrollment, particularly is starting to hit the middle school. All right, so our elementary enrollment stays the same, so there's no reduction in teachers that we're really going to benefit from at the elementary level. But in fact, we need more teachers 
at the middle school level as this bubble moves up into the middle school grades. Um, after next year, it looks like there may start to be a little bit of relief. Not as much to balance what we're going to have to increase, but a little bit of relief at the elementary level as births seem to be declining a little bit in the town and we're not seeing as many people move in. And of course, we'll all be curious to see what impact the current economy has on that rate of movement as well. And one of the things I think to think about when people think about enrollment growth, they tend to think about communities where a lot of houses are being built, other parts of the country, you know, a lot large tracts of land. The growth that we've seen in the population of a thousand kids has been accomplished largely without a growth in the population of Needham. So, you know, it's very hard. You can't have the same, same kind of prediction because what you're seeing is, in essence, is some generational turnover, some people moving in with kids, maybe, maybe larger families. It's very hard to tell, but you can't just look and say, well, there's this much more land, we're going to grow for a while, and then we're going to stop. Needham is and has always been a very desirable community. If you talk to the real estate agents, uh, even now they'll say it's not terrible. I mean, it's taking longer, but they're not seeing any slackening of interest in people moving into Needham. In fact, what I think they're seeing is people who a year ago didn't think they could afford Needham looking again. So it's very hard to predict those numbers. And I think when we do any kind of budgeting, both operational and especially capital, which is you know planning for buildings, which we have to do well in advance, we have to plan for a range of scenarios. Maybe it's flat, maybe it's a little down, maybe it keeps going up. And, and we, if we don't do that, then it's going to cost us more later. So we have to be flexible in our planning. And I, so enrollment certainly is a, is a continuing theme in the, in the development of the budget. And on the slide shows that will increase by about 40, 35, 40 students next year, which is a slower rate of growth. On average, it's been about 2% over time. We're actually going to be a little bit more than that because we know that our kindergarten That's enrollments correct. are again back That's up. Right. So I'm not sure what, um, you know, maybe another 20, 25 students it beyond that. It could be because kindergarten certainly has, uh, uh, has spiked recently right. uh, with some of, our, some right. of our, our students. One of the points with regard to enrollment beyond the operating costs is we have to have room for these students. And um, you know, we, a number of years ago, <coughs> built some new schools we renovated Broadmeadow and built Elliott School thinking that that was going to take care of us for quite a while because of the enrollment projections we had. And in fact, we got more students and those are full. So, I mean, it's one thing to add a teacher if you have an additional 25 kids, but it's harder to add a classroom. So that's a, that's a part of our planning too. And as Michael said, you need to be prepared for a range of possibilities that may, that any of which may occur. Sometimes in these budget discussions, there's a, such a focus, and there needs to be on numbers and, and, and ratios and percentages. The reality is this budget, as, as adopted by the school committee, includes a few things. And one of the things it includes is two teachers at the middle school to meet this increased enrollment, which right. is a good thing. The school committee struggled with that. Uh, Glenn Brand and his staff talked a lot about that. And uh, so there will be an increase in staffing to meet the, the surge in enrollment, uh, particularly at the sixth grade. And, and that certainly will be helpful, and that will keep class sizes around 22 to 24 um, in, the, in the sixth grade, which will, which will be very good. So you, you have, uh, despite all of these obstacles, you've been able to, to, uh, to address that. Um, and you, you mentioned briefly, maybe if we could touch on this for a second, one of the uh, factors in the budget development process is trying to keep uh, costs as low as possible, particularly for those programs that are subsidized, athletics and transportation, for example. Maybe if you could chat just a little bit about transportation. We have uh, put out an all-call, if you will, a survey to parents. I sent a letter recently asking for parents um, to, to indicate to us if the school committee decided to adopt uh, a different transportation program, a policy around uh, routing and, and who will pay, um, would, would folks continue to sign up? What have, what have we learned from that so far, and, and where, where do we need to go uh, regarding transportation? Um, what we've learned so far is that approximately two-thirds of the respondents, both uh, who live in so-called hazard areas designated by the town as areas where there is no sidewalk or other impediments to walking, uh, as well as folks who live in the mile and a half to two mile radius from their school, which is actually not mandated under state law. Uh, we are mandated to provide transportation at two miles, um, that those folks would um, perhaps continue, two-thirds of the folks who responded to us would continue uh, perhaps to um, take the bus to, um, uh, to, t to avail themselves of our transportation program, uh, even if they were to pay a fee. And I think certainly the school committee would um, 
uh, would recommend and would uh, support folks continuing to take the bus because, as everyone knows, uh, we want to alleviate uh, cars and congestion in the parking lots at pickups and dismissals. So we want people to continue to take the bus, and it seems as if there is some uh, interest in um, folks doing that, which will um, inform the next piece of our transportation budgeting process, which is to uh, crunch those numbers and um, figure out how many buses we're going to need for next year and finish the budget process there. Now I'm curious to know if any, if, if Michael or Don or Marianne have heard from community members about transportation and what that may mean to them um, as you think about that. Uh, there's been a little bit, there's been a little bit of response. Yes. Uh, yeah. uh, people talking <coughs> primarily about particular intersections, um, like the intersection of uh, Highland Ave and West Street. Um, not, you know, being afraid to let their kids walk, particularly the younger kids, being concerned about the price. Of the bus, and um, and also talking about the increased congestion possibility at the school that you mentioned. Right now, I think we're looking into that. I think you know we realize that if if um, we have these areas where all most kids have been bused, and there may be a need for crossing guards, there may be a need for other kinds of things, and that may be a cost. So all that gets uh, factored into the equation. I know that one of the things that, that uh, Ann has been thinking about, and based on some feedback the school committee has received, uh, that perhaps part of the, the, the formula moving forward is a family cap, right. um, as you've done with, uh, with the athletic program. That may uh, you know, mitigate the, the concern and the financial burden on some families and uh, still provide the revenue you need to, to run the program, which will allow you to allocate resources to teachers and, and, and other parts of the school program, which in the end is, is what it's... Uh, uh, what it's about. Dan, I do want to jump in just quickly and note that um, Needham Public Schools has had in the past and will continue to have um, a uh, fee waiver program for uh, folks who um, find it a financial hardship to, to pay our fee. Uh, in some cases the fee is waived, in some cases uh, the fee is prorated um, based on some income considerations. So families are always welcome to avail themselves of that program. What I think that particular challenge shows us is that there are no easy answers, there's no low-hanging fruit, because there are always consequences. I mean, it seems, and some people would look and say, well, get rid of hazard busing, that's easy. That's something that we do, very few other communities do. But the increased congestion, the increased hazard, we have schools that were not built to drive to, in essence, the amount of time that teachers and principals spend in the, you know, in the drive lines, in the parking lots, the strain on families of having lots of cars, the additional hazard, the additional police. I mean. There is no easy answer. Once you do something which in, on one level says, well, gee, that seems pretty easy to do, you realize you cause a whole, no, a whole set of other challenges. And I think that's what we face with just about everything we look at. There are some things that you can look at and say, well, we should just do that. But once you dig under the covers, you realize it's not quite as simple as that. Well, and I think... Well, I think, I think it's important also to recognize, I mean, the news that Ann got that potentially, you know, 70% of the folks would stay with us <coughs> opens up the question of, of figuring out, you know, could we in fact reduce the fee some, which would also conceivably help. I think those are all options that are on the table because, frankly, it's beneficial to us to encourage folks to stay on the yes, bus absolutely. because we don't absolutely. want the extra cars at the schools. And you look at some schools, I mean, Hillside's the most noticeable because it's really tucked back in the neighborhood and the others <coughs> tend to be more on a main street. but. But it's not a good thing to add more car traffic. We well, and it, and it speaks to the, the reality that the, the, the school's infrastructure, uh, particularly around parking and driving, for, for all the schools is really a challenge. And, and uh, the, the school's growing enrollment pushes on the infrastructure. Uh, I, I, I know that uh, Mike Schwinden will be looking for an additional classroom, not this coming year, but next year because his enrollment is increasing. And we'll have to balance that with, with all the enrollment needs. So. The infrastructure on, on, on the town schools is certainly um, increasing, even as new construction, a high school, for example, in High Rock, is providing that relief in the short term. Um, and because of some specific venues like Hillside, that, that will continue to be a, uh, a push and a strain on, uh, on the system. You know, Dan, you talk about the fees. I mean, we, we do look at the fees. I don't think we've been able to do a very good job in keeping the fees down. In fact, uh, the athletic fee went down last year, and it's going back up as it stands now. Um, I, in two weeks, I start my 10th year on the school committee, amazingly. Um, and the first years that I was on, we used to talk about if, if we had level funding, just the same amount of money, what we would do. If we had level service, you know, 
same services for more kids what we would do and we actually talked about program enhancements that we wanted to bring in that stopped around 2002 2003 it's just a fond memory now um, and I think it's after that time that some of these fees went into place because we've tried to protect the teacher in the classroom and the class size um, comes a point and it's coming more every year when as somebody said there's more pressure on that because their revenue just isn't available to meet the expenses that we have. Well, let's talk about that. What programs have, have diminished? We have enrollment is, is growing, maybe a little bit more slowly this year, but certainly it's been growing over time. But what programs have been affected or diminished over time? Um, what, are, what are some of the things that, that you have seen uh, done in, in your tenure or that, that parents are talking to you about? Uh, certainly there have been some impacts on, for example, in the elementary uh, program, uh, some programs have been pulled out. Uh, just to sustain a, a level of service? You know, I, th I think the whole program thing is kind of a mixed bag sort of question. When we talk about programs at the elementary level, for example, bowling, being pulled out, certainly everybody talks about elementary foreign language. That's a very noticeable one. But there are a lot of um, very small things, and, th and they represent a trade-off, so that we've seen reductions in library and media time. We've seen reductions in PE, where children only go to PE once a week now. You've seen reductions in art and music and the amount of time that they spend in art and music classes. Now, on the one hand, you could say kind of the good thing is that means more has gone into academic time. It's not that those children are doing nothing. They're actually spending more time sort of on core subjects. And it's part of the pressure that the elementary school feels, and there's just not simply enough hours in the day to do everything that we'd like to do because, in fact, children learn through a variety of different ways, and you hate to cut off those other opportunities and uh, especially I think the opportunities for children to move around like the PE and the and the recess as you cut recess time and that type of thing um, to make other things fit That's absolutely, those are the two things that I would mention and I think it may be the case I'm not sure but that we've added some electives at the high school and middle school but I think some other things have been lost um, I'd have to go back and look and it's those kinds of things a lot of kids come to school because they want to be on a sports team or they're really into art or music or maybe they like to do TV studio work um, that's what keeps them going and that's where they're going to end up in their careers perhaps it's not we do need to do basic skills but what we do is a lot about a lot more than that and that actually talk about what we hear from parents parents understand that in Needham parents tend to support the schools the, the whole community tends to support the schools actually and parents tend to support the schools and they do not want to see um, it just be a back to basics kind of approach where we don't have art and we don't have music and we don't have sports and other kinds of things. So we're, we, you know, we try to balance that. And then the reality has been, though, that the, the principals and directors, because of this, the, this climate, and Needham is absolutely very supportive of its, of its, of its schools and, and certainly of the community, but of, due to this climate, programming, as I've understand it over the last couple of budget cycles has really focused on developing some programming around special education and English language learner programs to provide administration and structure um, for those programs. For example, we're trying to enhance our preschool program. Um, but it has not necessarily been uh, to, to come up with more innovation at, at the elementary, middle school, and high school level. Um, you're trying to maintain some, some core programs. So there is a, uh, there is a bit of a dilemma there um, and pressure. I think if you look at our headcount, what, what you actually find is that our headcounts have increased to service our special ed and ELL kinds of populations yes. mm -hmm. at the expense of teaching positions in other areas right. because just that's the way the budgets fit and it causes a crunch for all of us. And that's true actually everywhere. That's not just Needham. It's not just Needham, but right. it's hard for everyone. Yeah, so, so we, ha we, have we have enrollment growth, uh, we, we certainly have some programs that have been affected and diminished over time, even as we say we're bringing forward a level service budget, so that's, that certainly is a dilemma. Revenue, it, it seems that, that revenue is an area where, where there's a lot of conversation as well, but maybe some frustration because there's not as much that can be done with that. Michael, you, you've been thinking about this a lot, and, and what do we do about revenue, both at a local level and at a statewide level, to, to affect what we want to do? What's very interesting is I think this was the first year I can remember we have a budget hearing and we're seeing fewer and fewer people come up and say, oh, you're just, you're just not controlling your costs. You don't know how to spend the money. We hear less and less of that because I think we've made the point that we run the system efficiently. We hear people say we need to find more revenue. And, and that's good news that, that that's been recognized. 
you know, a few years ago when we were looking at the, the numbers of the 370 towns in Massachusetts, we were sixth from the bottom, tied for sixth from the bottom in the percentage of our budget that's paid for through the state. It was 11.3 percent. I mean, that's just ludicrously low. Um, and Massachusetts as a state, as a commonwealth, is in the bottom tier of all of the states in the country in terms of how much of the education is paid for at the state level. That means it falls on the property tax, which causes all sorts of inequities and problems. Um, so that has been a real problem, and addressing that has been a high priority. And as Don mentioned, our legislators have been aggressive of that. They have worked very hard to create and protect the program that will bring us from the 11 percent to the 17 and a half percent in five years. And we're about midway through that program. And quite frankly, if you've looked at the last couple of years, it's what's made the difference. That additional aid coming in is what's made the difference between having to cut to a 3 percent and being able to do the 4.5 because the town has more money coming in. And that's going to continue for a couple of more years, and I know that there's a, a lot of momentum to try to make that go higher, but that's going to have to be balanced at the state level with the others. I mean, I, I can look at it and argue that it's an, it's an economic development imperative. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts, this region, you know, we're not blessed with natural resources or great weather. We are very smart people. And our, our economy depends upon smart people in new industries going back to the fishing fleets, to the financial service industry, technology, biotech, clean technology. That requires edu an educated workforce. So you can make a very good case that for the state and for all of us to invest in that is just investing in the health of our community. So we have to do that. There's been a lot of discussion about local option taxes. That's a politically charged issue. But I think our legislators have been very good about this. We have to focus at the state level. Not much is going to happen at the federal level. Massachusetts is a net provider to the federal government. Very little comes back to us. But I think at the state level is where we have to focus um, on, on doing that because we don't want to have to add more fees which is really the only option. And I do think, you know, the local citizens in the town are involved either through Citizens for Needham Schools or, or CNS is supporting Stand for Children, which is also doing lobbying at the state. I mean, so there is a lot more organized lobbying activity that citizens can get involved in as well to work and advocate for these issues. Well, the, the, the alternative, of course, is to push on having another override or having more overrides. Don, I, I, I don't know what you, you're hearing about that, or that certainly is a struggle. Well, we're, we're talking about it now. There is a plan to have an override for operating costs for the new High Rock School that will be opening. Next November, I think, is it? Uh, next November would be the override, and the school opens the following November. September. Uh, so following September, September. right. But it gives beginning, kids a full year at High Rock. Beginning of school. <laughs> um, we are also considering if that would be a good time to look at things that we have lost in the past five years, probably in particular, and see if the community is willing to restore them. Um, there are a couple things going on. We're, we're still looking at the costs, the actual costs for High Rock, what we think that's going to be. We're going to take a look at what we have lost, because we've also gained things. I mean, but, but what if there are net losses in terms of teachers and increasing class size or electives or so forth, we look at that. And the third thing that I would refer to one of you is uh, financial projection of what our costs are likely to be going forward. And, and that is certainly something that, that we'll look ahead to what, what the costs will be for the school department as we continue to work with the finance committee, with the town manager, the select and the school committee. I mean, it's been a real good collaborative process and that, that has to continue. Um, well, there's no question that, that growing enrollment, uh, the need to think, as you're just mentioning, about the programs that we have and that, that programs that you, you want to have for the children in Needham, and, and also thinking about revenue. Those are all key, key themes that have been emerging as, as we think about the development of the, uh, the budget. Well, thanks for the conversation this morning. Uh, we look Thank forward you. to the work as it unfolds. Thanks.